start our first session, which will be on ovarian cancer. I will ask our moderator, Dr. Amina Tejani, the medical oncologist from King Abdelaziz Medical City, and Dr. Aboud Abdu, uh, the Ghani oncology consultant from Dahran Hospital, John Hopkins Aramco. Please, Dr. Amin and Dr. Aboud, uh, the mic is yours. We can start the session. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Nashimi, and thank you for the organizing committee. Uh, and uh, special thank you, the course director, Dr. Nashimi and Meteri, for uh, her kind invitation to, to participate in the sixth annual meeting, master class of gynecological malignancies. Uh, I am Dr. Amin Tijani, consultant medical oncologist at King Abdelaziz uh, Medical City, National Guard in Riyadh. And it is my pleasure to moderate the first session, which is the session 1A, Ovarian Cancer, with Dr. Aboud Abdo. And he's a gynecologic oncology subspecialist in the Haran Health Centers, John Hopkins Aramco Healthcare. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Thomas Herzog. Professor Herzog. He's an internationally well-known figure in his field. He's annually actually participating in this master class. Professor Herzog he is the deputy director of both uh, the Barrett Cancer Center and the University of Cincinnati Cancer Institute. And he's also the vice chair of quality and safety for obstetrics and gynecology University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Professor Herzog has three talks today. The first one, he will give us updates on the frontline treatment of ovarian cancer. Please, Prof, the, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, very clear. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, um, I don't know if you remember, but last year uh, we convened in Riyadh right, right before everything got shut down. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I wish I was with you directly. Um, I've always enjoyed my trips to Saudi, to the kingdom. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we're, we're able, we were not able to do that in person this year, but I'm very excited that uh, um, uh, hopefully we will be able to uh, be together again next year. Can you see my slides at all or no? Yes, yes, clear. But, uh, right. Make it bigger, okay. Yeah. Okay, we're all set then? Yeah, thanks. Um, hmm, I don't think this is the talk that I want to show. Hang on. Yes, this is. Okay, great. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to talk about uh, the frontline treatment of ovarian cancer first to sort of start things off and the, to um, set, set the foundation for this morning conference where we talk about PARPs and anti-angiogenesis, um, as well as immunotherapy and, uh, recurrent ovarian cancer. So there's a number of talks that will come off of this particular talk. Um, and hopefully we're able to give you a good understanding of the current treatment of frontline ovarian cancer, because things have changed significantly in the last four to five years. These are my disclosures. So the, the first thing that one really thinks about is the differences between uh, the different cell types that we see with ovarian cancer. And I think that's probably been one of the challenges um, that we see uh, that people do not understand. It's really our first foray into personalized medicine is understanding these different histologic subtypes because each of them are associated with their very own um, uh, genetic changes that we see in terms of um, either deletions or uh, molecular aberrations. And so the first and the most common, almost 70% of ovarian cancers 
or high-grade serous cancers, followed by low-grade serous, clear cell, endometrioid, and mucinous. Now, high-grade serous and endometrioid have very different outcomes than the other ones. So low-grade serous obviously is a very indolent tumor. The problem with low-grade serous, though, is that it, it, it uh, is not very responsive to chemotherapy. So these, these are the issues um, that, that we're really dealing with. These are the associated mutations that we most commonly see with these, and they have become a bit of an opportunity, if you will, uh, to be able to intervene. And we've certainly seen that with low-grade serous, for example, or with MEK inhibitors. High-grade serous, we've had a hard time being able to target P53, although it's present in over 90% of these tumors in terms of a deleterious mutation. Genomic instability, however, as you will see in our, our talk that's next on PARP inhibitors, is something that is um, uh, very common for us to be able to attack from a therapeutic standpoint. With mucinous tumors, we've tried treating these more as GI tumors. However, we've not been all that successful. Endometroid, P10, PI3K, uh, as well as obviously microsatellite instability in about 20% of these tumors has been something that uh, has been more promising in terms of uh, immuno-oncology drugs. In clear cell tumors, um, we've, we've certainly had some, tum some studies that have attacked the ARID1A pathway. However, they've not been very successful to date. So we certainly need uh, more translational science in this area. One thing I wanted to stress was no matter what the cell type, because even in the more rare, even mucinous tumors, we occasionally still do see BRCA mutations. So it's very important that we test for genetic changes. So all our leading oncology societies in our country, ASCO, SGO, NCCN, all recommend uh, testing for epithelial ovarian cancer for assessment of BRCA. Why? It's not only... Um, prognostic and now predictive for frontline treatment, but it's also uh, allows you to do cascade testing whereby you're able to uh, interdict with family members and therefore save their lives. So it's very important. So where are we right now in terms of the standard of care for frontline ovarian cancer? And this is looking at the, the trials to date. So we have GOG 111, uh, and EROTCOV10 that established uh, adding paclitaxel over cyclophosphamide conferred a, an advantage in terms of either PFS or OS in the case of GOG111. And then could you substitute cisplatinum and 24-hour paclitaxel with carboplatinum and three-hour paclitaxel? And the answer was yes, based on the equivalency trials that were done with AGO and GOG158. Um, by Bob Ozels, and you can see the numbers there. So that really became our standard uh, going back to the early 2000s. So really our standard hasn't changed all that much uh, since the mid 1996s until 2019. So really remarkable that we went almost 25 years without a change in the standard of care, uh, whereby we've looked at a lot of other things, but they really haven't changed the standard. So as you can see here, we still uh, understand the role of surgery with frontline ovarian cancer in terms of trying to, um, to balk these patients or cytoreduce to reduce the tumor to what we call R0, meaning that there's no residual disease, followed by a platinum-based chemotherapy with taxane, usually carboplatinum paclitaxel. And then we've looked at dose dense, IP, HIPEC, biologics such as bevacizumab, and then of course maintenance therapy, um, and we really didn't change the standard all that much until more recently, so we'll, we'll get into that. Here's looking at the intraperitoneal trials that look very promising. Um, for the first three, where you see a, a 20 to 30% improvement in overall survival and uh, progression-free survival. However, um, in GOG-252, where we compared more equal doses, we found that IV versus IP was really no different. So for most of us, 
Um, we've gotten away from doing intraperitoneal chemotherapy based on the more recent literature because of the hassle factor, if you will, uh, of doing the intraperitoneal route, uh, meaning higher toxicity for the patient as well as the physician when the catheter doesn't work, et cetera. So um, uh, I think there's been a, a, a bit of a, a lack of interest for most countries in doing intraperitoneal. Uh, however, we have had more recent data with HIPEC that has reignited the interest in perhaps thinking about doing uh, intraperitoneal chemotherapy, but with the heated component. And this is looking at a study um, out, uh, out of the Netherlands uh, by Dr. Van Driel that looked at taking patients in a neoadjuvant setting and um, randomizing them to uh, HIPEC with cisplatinum at 100 milligrams per meter squared intraoperatively versus no HIPEC followed by uh, standard chemotherapy for three cycles. And of course they received uh, at least three cycles prior, three to four. Uh, and they looked at PFS and OS, and then they, they saw that the uh, recurrence-free survival, in this case, uh, uh, much a surrogate for PFS, uh, was different, but not by very much. So um, three and a half months. Usually three and a half months does not confer a very big OS advantage at all. And in this case, oddly, uh, it conferred almost a 12 month advantage. So it's a little hard to understand exactly what's going on here. Some people accuse this uh, trial of being guilty of a type one st statistical error. Others say that this is the path to the beginning of understanding that HIPEC works. So it, usually one trial never changes practice. So we're awaiting other randomized data because all the data up till date, up to date has been uh, with non-randomized data in the HIPEC world until this trial. So we await more randomized data, which should be forthcoming. But this is a very interesting trial with a, a very good hazard ratio. Toxicity in this trial also oddly was um, not that much increased uh, over the non hypec arm. So we saw more infection. There was definitely more abdominal pain, uh, a little more ileus. But in the other areas that we usually see significant changes, there was not that big of a change. So um, we'll see what happens um, uh, moving forward. What about dose dense? So we saw in the Japanese literature that uh, prescribing more uh, drug over a shorter period of time or giving the drug in a dose-dense way is more effective uh, in terms of PFS, progression-free survival, and OS, overall survival. And this is the study schema. And here you see the, the final, and there were several publications uh, with uh, early analysis and interim analysis, and then a final analysis. And this is the final analysis that looked at uh, the advantages. And you can see those curves are clearly favoring the dose dense, although not by a huge margin, but there was an advantage. Um, and uh, those curves held uh, the advantage all the way to the end. So there, there was an interest in doing dose dense in the United States, Europe, and the rest of the world. However, when we did the study in the United States, we found there was absolutely no difference. The difference here though was 262 allowed the investigator and patient to choose whether they would wanna be on bevacizumab. And I, the curves are small there, but you can see those curves are almost on top of each other. And when 85% or a little short of 85%, about, I think it was about 82 or 83% chose to have bevacizumab because it was part of the trial and it was free, you saw no difference. Now in that smaller subset of about 15 plus percent, you did see an advantage if you did dose dense. However, the MITO7 trial um, showed absolutely no difference as you can see on those curves. And then ICON8 where they had three arms where they not only fractionated just the paclitaxel giving 80 milligrams, which was the standard every week, which would get you 240 milligrams instead of 175 milligrams per meter squared over three weeks, you can see that those curves were no different, but not only in ICON-8 did they fractionate the paclitaxel, they also looked at fractionating the platinum with an AUC of two. 
Uh, so three arms, one in which they just fractionated the paclitaxel and the other where they fractionated both, you can see there was no difference. So for most of us, those dents uh, ha has uh, somewhat died, and so, hence the red arrow at the uh, top left of the screen. So where are we with that? Most people are not doing dose dents anymore. It's the standard. It's certainly an option. Um, the side effects are a little bit worse. And we do not see the advantage, uh, at least in non-Asians. Now, what needs to be worked out is, uh, is the question of, are there unique pharmacokinetics with Asian patients? Um, because even in the US, when we look at our Asian patients, they seem to do a little bit better. The big change, obviously, has been uh, with bevacizumab. And we're going to have a whole lecture on anti-angiogenesis. So I'm not going to spend much time there. Um, and then we've looked at the concept of maintenance of just using paclitaxel. And the, and the idea behind maintenance is this, that if there's going to be residual disease, which we know is present in over two thirds of our patients with advanced stage disease after six cycles of chemotherapy, why do we just wait for that cancer to regrow? Should we not do something to help um, have our patient then be able to um, have a chance of, of responding and not wait for that cancer to regrow. And that was the idea. So th in this case, they used uh, paclitaxel and another type of paclitaxel um, that you see there. Um, so here's the overall survival. It was no different. And so that sort of ended uh, the maintenance concept other than bevacizumab up until the more recent era with uh, PARP inhibitors. So these are the trials that we think about in terms of how they've changed our standard of care. And here's where we are now. We've gone full circle and we're back in the middle. So with PARP inhibitors, though, we have had a significant change in where we are. Um, and that, that's been wonderful. Um, and you can see here the, the differences. So we are um, looking at 14 new approvals in the last six years. Um, Two of them have been with bevacizumab, but the others have all have really involved PARP other than the uh, pembrolizumab with uh, tumors that show microsatellite instability. So here's where we stand right now, and this just came out in the last week. So we're looking at um, the, the whole concept of, um, you know, what do we do when? based on molecular signatures. And so we'll get into that in terms of where we stand right now with some of the other trials, but really depends on the molecular signature in terms of BRCA and homologous recombination deficiency as to how we're gonna treat the patient after frontline chemo. So the frontline chemo backbone is still the same. However, the other treatment has changed significantly. So in conclusion, PARP inhibitors have a major impact on frontline ovarian cancer landscape. Immunotherapy is um, 0 for 3, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, combinations of the PARP inhibitors, uh, anti-angiogenesis, and even immune therapies has uh, really risen to the forefront. We need to better merge our basic science discovery with clinical trial mechanisms that we have in place. Um, and I can't emphasize enough the importance of frontline surgery, trying to get these patients to no gross residual. Um, and so we're really looking at smaller, smarter trials with larger, larger changes between the uh, control arm and the experimental arm to really see the differences because we have so many opportunities uh, moving forward. So thank you very much. I'll see you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Robert. 